Oh, good. You made it. We don't have long agents, so I'm going to be brief. I need to talk to you about Nerd Bourbon Book Club. It's a book discussion show that happens at least once a month on the Nerd Bourbon network of podcasts. Your mission is to find out what book they're reading and listen in on their discussion about it. And your mission begins immediately. Hello and welcome to Nerd Bourbon Book Club Episode 3, uh, wherein we are going to be discussing Jason Schreier's Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, the triumphant, turbulent stories behind how video games are made. I am your illustrious host, Seth Sturgill. And it's your boy, Hot Toddy. <laughs> Is that your new intro now? I think so. I think it's going to be my new intro. You're going to have to listen to the, to the latest episode of Nerd Bourbon to know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> so Todd, October's book club book, it's Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. Um, I think the way we're going to tackle this, so Blood, Sweat, and Pixels is a very like chapter-based book. Like The book essentially is an introduction chapter, and then each kind of game that the, uh, that the book covers has its own chapter. And mm-hmm. then, you know, kind of like an epilogue chapter. So I think the best way to go about this is to give our generalized thoughts and then sort of from there build into, you know, go chapter by chapter and sort of give how we feel about each individual chapter because they do, you know, some of them play into each other, but for the most part, it's very much a, uh, I would say it's very much like a a compartmentalized sort of book. Like each chapter is sort of its own thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, So shit, I mean, how'd you feel about this overall? I enjoyed reading it. It was like, I think we've talked, we were talking about this before we even recorded. It's just like, if you knew about, some of the, some of the stuff happening in the book, it's like all right, cool, it's whatever. But if you if some of the stuff you don't know about, it's like really interesting. Yeah, there's you know my only um, it's it's really weird. Like the book occupies a weird space for me because I'm somebody who like, you know, I'm very like I, I pay a lot of attention to the video game industry and like I, uh, you know, I, I kind of keep my finger on the pulse and and like Jason Schreier in particular, like I've followed his work for a few years now and I, a lot of this book is based on. The journalism that he's already reported he works for kotaku he's he's a great reporter um he's one of the few good video game journalists out there but uh it's so so a lot of this stuff is based on his previous journalism and so as a result i found myself as a result i found myself sort of like knowing a lot of this already but it's still it's still like just a really well-written book and a really good tome of like just kind of teaching you um especially for the uninitiated uh, who don't know how much it fucking sucks to make video games, um, and how impossibly hard it is. Uh, it's just a really good, like, just a really good sort of tome to, to teach you about that. And in fact, there's a quote on the back of the book from uh, Cliff Blazinski that says, uh, "May need to make it required reading for my studio," which is just so appropriate because, like, it just really drives home how how hard it is to make video games. But shit, so let, let me just, before we get into it, let me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and list off all the chapters here. So going in order, we have, uh, and again, each chapter is, is the, the individualized, compartmentalized story of a singular game's development. So the first chapter is Pillars of Eternity, and then Uncharted 4, Stardew Valley, Diablo 3, Halo Wars, Dragon Age Inquisition, Shovel Knight, Destiny, the Witcher Three and Star Wars thirteen thirteen, so uh, shit. Let's uh, let's go through them all, man. Um, how did you feel about the Pillars of Eternity chapter? Um, I actually knew nothing about um Pillars of Eternity, other than the fact that it was a it was like a Kickstarter I. thing. Yeah, I didn't. I've um, never played it or anything like that. Yeah, that's like. I mean, that's the only thing I ever knew about it. Like, I just knew. I I've heard about it. I knew it was the whole like there was a big Kickstarter thing, and that yeah. was it. Like, so it was actually a really interesting read. Other because I didn't know shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, me too. I, I really did not know a whole hell of a lot about Pillars of Eternity, and I didn't even know... I think he mentions in the uh, towards the end of the chapter that they, like, kick-started a sequel, and I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. I didn't know that either. <laughs> like, like I've heard good things about Pillars, uh, Pillars of Eternity, but I just never uh, never played it. I, I love those old-school, you know, RPGs, but um, this, this really was a... Uh, this was a really good introduction to the book in terms of like, okay, yeah, making video games is really fucking hard, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Even just something as simple as like finding 
finding publishers to fund the games like mm-hmm. that alone is so hard and kickstarter really kind of changed everything and my favorite part of the pillars of eternity story it's it's so funny and interesting to me how like the story really shifts the moment that like broken age goes on kickstarter yeah and you sort of realize like holy shit like double fine and broken age kind of changed everything you mm-hmm. know now it's so common for like games and stuff to be kickstarted. Oh yeah, dude. yeah. Crowdfunding is just like that's like kind of the new thing. Man. It's so like, common now, but it wasn't yeah. even just a few years ago. You know what I mean? And you almost forget about that. You almost forget about you know, like it seems so like obvious now, and like shit. You know, Shovel Knight, which we'll talk about later, was crowdfunded. You know what I mean? Like these were the the crowdfunding games is like a a thing now, and it wasn't until Broken Age and Pillars of Eternity really sort of piggybacked off of that. Mm. But um, it was just, I don't know, it was just really interesting, like, learning about um, learning about the game's sort of, like, progression, like, and, and the and the designy things that people sort of, like, learned about it. I, I don't have, you know, I, what was really fascinating about this to me was these guys were going to be making... Correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't they going to be making like an RPG for the Xbox One that like utilized Connect and shit like that? Like, That's, wasn't that the whole deal with this? That, that sounds about right. Yeah, I, it's it's been a while since I uh, since I, I've read I, I read this book. I, we uh, we fin- we both finished this a little while ago, but and that chapter in particular. But if I'm not mistaken, the sort of impetus for Pillars of Eternity was a uh, an RPG that they were being contracted to make for Xbox One. Which was like a, uh, and like Microsoft wanted them to like utilize Connect and shit like that, and it, it, it was like this whole mess, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and you know from there they sort of had to like kind of do their own thing, and um, I don't know, man. Like it's it's really fascinating. Obsidian is a fascinating developer. Like like Obsidian is like one of those. It, it's almost a miracle that Obsidian is still around because they've always just been like. I feel like Obsidian is constantly, like, they have these tumultuous development cycles, oh, and yeah. they're, like, constantly just, like, hanging on by a thread, you know? But they make great games. You know, they have games, like, they, they were responsible for Stick of Truth and New Vegas. And, like... Mm, New Vegas. That's a game right there. Yeah, and, like, these these great games, right? But, like, they, they always have these, like, troubled developments, and, like, they always end up coming out on top and everything, but it's, you know, it's funny. There's a... Uh, and I think this describes Obsidian really well and, and sort of their development really well. Um, there's a moment where they talked about <laughs> working for a publisher and how Obsidian sort of... You know, and every Really, every developer doesn't like to work for a publisher because a publisher always wants to have you know, some structure of control over the project yeah. because they're putting their money into it. You know, For Obsidian, like for example, they were working for Bethesda, obviously, with New Vegas, and they were like, hey, if you get... I think the deal was if you get like an 85 or something or an 80 or or above average on Metacritic. Yeah, they get like you, a bonus or some shit. Yeah, you get like a bonus. Yeah. And they were like one point off at yeah. the end of it and they didn't get their bonus. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I remember that part. So it's just, it's kind of a nice like the Pillars of Eternity chapter. Like not only is it a good intro to like this this whole sort of kind of kind of world and a good like way to introduce you to the sort of way the book is going to be but it also is like a nice kind of story of how they really turned it around for themselves and obsidian finally you know yeah they have this they have this history of great games but you know like i said tumultuous development but now they're sort of the the masters of their own domain with pillars of eternity which is a game that everybody seems to have loved and this is you know and this is something this is a common theme you'll probably see us say in this in this episode like shit, I kind of want to play Pillars of Eternity now, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to be a common theme throughout these chapters. Yeah, because it's just sort of like some of these were games that I've I've played many of these, but like some of them were definitely games that I hadn't played, and and the book gave me a, a newfound appreciation for them. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on to Uncharted Four, how did you uh, how did you find this chapter? I I think this is like the one chapter that I knew sm- a little bit of it. Yeah. going forward so i was just like it was cool to get in you know more in-depth like information about the whole situation with that game yeah what's but. funny about uncharted 4 for those who don't know um you know uncharted 4 was going to be a, a fairly different game uh 
you know, than it ended up being. And it had its own sort of troubled development, which is not uncommon at Naughty Dog. You know, Naughty Dog is a studio that, like, you know, crunch is, like, an accepted thing at Naughty Dog. And the book drives that home. Like, Naughty Dog embraces crunch in a way that most studios don't. Like, Naughty Dog's like, all right, guys, like, towards the end of this, straight up, just be aware it's going to be crunch and like because you know every developer ends up with crunch like crunch is just sort of an accepted thing it seems like in the games industry but naughty dog really embraces it in a way that most studios don't and um for uncharted 4 like amy hennig was originally going to be working on it and she had a totally different vision in mind for like what the story ended up being the bones are still there of amy hennig's original story but once Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley took it over, like it really sort of, you know, took a different a different route. And I, I loved Uncharted Four in spite of it all. Um But the interesting thing is, like, I don't think we're ever really gonna know what truly happened with Amy Hennig, like and, mm-hmm. and just the original like I don't think we're ever really gonna know what happened there. This book sort of does its best to kind of piece it all together, but I there's still like there, there was all these rumors that like Straley and Druckmann like kind of pushed her out and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the the book doesn't postulate that. It doesn't like confirm nor deny that. Those are just rumors. But it's like, I don't think we're ever gonna know the full story. But I think this game or uh, I think this book does a good job of like, of kind of not per- not like like I said not kind of perpetuating those rumors, but but sort of picking up the pieces and and making sense of it all in the best way that it can. Yeah. And it's an interesting chapter. I mean, and, and, you know, like I said, Uncharted 4, you know, spoilers, ended up being a damn good game <laughs> in spite of its <laughs> development. But this was definitely, definitely one where, like, I knew a lot about it going in, uh, like you said. But still, I, I think a solid chapter overall. Uh, and definitely worth, you know, definitely worth uh, reporting about. It's not like, uh, like Uncharted 4 is an interesting game. That's for mm. sure. Definitely. Uh, moving on to a game whose development I knew basically nothing about, Stardew Valley. This is probably like, you know, in the first couple chapters, this was definitely my favorite chapter. Mm, because, mm-hmm. because, dude, it's like, when you realize it's like you're sitting there reading it, it's like, holy shit, this dude did everything. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And it's funny because I, um, this book came out right around the same time Stardew Valley came out on Switch. Maybe mm. Maybe a few weeks before Stardew Valley came out on Switch, and I've been like obsessed with Stardew Valley uh, since it came out on Switch, and um, so it was kind of perfect timing. Like it was kind of serendipitous. Like I was, you know, as I was kind of reading and or listening, rather, I should have mentioned at the beginning of this. I uh, this was my first foray into audiobooks. Like I've never been into the audiobook thing before. Maybe I'll talk about this in more detail on the main podcast, which we're recording after this. But um, it it, it was interesting. But anyway, yeah, as you said, like Eric Barone really did everything for this fucking game. Like from the you know from all of the pixel work, the game is entirely done in this gorgeous pixel art to the mm-hmm. dialogue to the music, and that was kind of the best and worst thing for the game. Because, like, he made his own schedule, and, like, he would, like, procrastinate and shit like that. And the game was in development for, like, what, like, five years? Yeah, and the thing is, like, I think, like, multiple times, especially for, like, the pixel art, is he had to, like, go and redo it because he got better as, like, time went on. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, once you do something for so long, your skill set changes and improves, you know? And and what's... um, what, What this book really drives home is, like, the support that he had from his from his girlfriend or wife or whatever um his significant other like really supported him throughout it all because he wasn't working you know like stardew valley essentially was his job he was bringing in no money and they were living in seattle you know and i think she was working like two or three jobs just to just to make ends meet and she supported him throughout this and you know like i i like that i like that the book spends a little bit of time uh spends a little time kind of giving her 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 due credit yeah you know? i mean i think it did get to the point where he did get like a part-time job but that was like yeah like about it yeah that even that though was like way later uh, and it, yeah. it talked about yeah, how he would go to like family functions and and like her parents would be like uh when's stardew valley coming out and he's like <laughs> uh a few months a few months <laughs> <laughs> you know but it's it makes you really appreciate like 
having played Stardew Valley, like, I'm going to go into this in a little more detail again on the main show. The game is, like, so fucking deep. Like, Stardew Valley is, like, impossibly deep. And there is, like, always stuff to do in it. So for this dude to have done all of this by himself throughout all of the struggles that he had and like I can't even imagine the toll it took on him like physically and like you know like throughout it all like that dude it's impressive to play something like Stardew Valley the most indie indie game there is and it is so deep and so immersive and like god it's it's fucking nuts. So the next chapter is, was about Diablo 3. This one was weird for me because Diablo 3, like, this was the one chapter where I felt like more than anything else, and it delved into the development a little bit of it, but I felt like more than anything else, it was also, like, it was almost just, like, an account of how things were when Diablo 3 launched. Yeah, that's that's fair, because that's definitely, uh, like, what the majority of that chapter is. The the thing that this chapter does that I that I did really like, because, like, on one hand, I was like, okay, well, so so much of this chapter is just, like, when Diablo 3 came out, there was, you know, Error 37 or whatever, and, like, you couldn't log into the servers, and it was a nightmare, and this, that, and the other. And, like, that's all kind of common knowledge if you were there, like I was when Diablo 3 launched. But, like, when uh, when you get into it, what I do really like is the way that, um, the way that the book talked about sort of the change that Diablo 3 underwent. Like... They, when they when they sort of realized when they sort of had to rethink where the fun in Diablo was you know because mm-hmm. they were so hung up on especially when it first came out like th- like there was a huge subset of even the developers at Blizzard who were like so hung up on what they thought Diablo was you know mm-hmm. that like they, they really kind of lost sight of it and didn't make that fun of a game as a result you know what I mean so like when Reaper of Souls came out, they really, like, turned it around. And, in fact, this is something that came up in the Destiny chapter. Like, when Destiny was doing a similar thing, when Bungie was having trouble with Destiny, they brought in people from Blizzard who gave a whole presentation about, like, hey, this is what we did for Diablo, and this is how we turned it around for Diablo. And they took notes of that and brought it into Taken King, you know? Yeah, that that was actually a very interesting part of the Destiny uh, chapter for me. I, was, oh, I had no idea. I mean, it makes sense, you know, because they're both owned by Activision and there's like interplay with Activision and Blizzard and all yeah. that. But I had no idea that that was a thing, you know. So that was that was really fascinating to me. Like, like Diablo three really really turned it around for itself, and I I liked it when it first came out for sure. But like playing Diablo three now is so much is such a more pleasurable experience. Shit, we used to play that game. Like every fucking day. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I still like. I, I love that game. It's it's a great game. Yeah. It's just so much fun. And like, uh, one one thing, one designery thing that I really appreciated. There's a little bit in there where he talks about um, how the person that inevitably I don't remember his name, but the person that inevitably like ended up taking over the Diablo three console project. Yeah. Was like adamant about having the like right stick roll in there. Yes. And he was like, and there were so many people that like were fighting against that. Like, no, 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 you can't have that, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, on console, like people want to move. Like if you watch people play shooters, they're just fucking jumping all the time. There needs to be something to shake up the the normal movement or people are going to get bored, you know? That was, a, that, honestly, that was a good call on him. It was a good call because I find yeah. myself rolling all the time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, good chapter overall. Um, the next chapter was actually surprisingly... Probably my favorite chapter of this book. Is it Halo Wars? Yes, Halo Wars. Yeah, okay. This is a really good chapter. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a fun read, dude. I actually really enjoyed Halo Wars. It was fucking fascinating. Like, I really liked the way that, um, you know, you, you forget. Like, at least I did coming into this. Like, I you forget about the rich kind of history that Ensemble as a studio had. Like, studio was around for like 20 some odd years. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, like, I didn't realize that they were actually acquired by Microsoft and that they were working on, like, all of these different projects. And, like, what's interesting is Halo Wars, like, they were working on a new IP. Like, they were yep, working uh, on yep. this brand new world. Yeah, that was just, I'm agreeing with you. Because, like, yeah, the, the, my, and Microsoft wasn't having it at that point, though, with uh, the new IP. <laughs> no, because, like, their, their whole thing was, like, okay, we want to make a strategy game and we want to make it work on consoles. 
We want to mm-hmm. make it so that you can play this fucking thing with a controller and it makes sense. And Microsoft was like, okay, great. We love what you're doing with the controls, but it's got to be Halo. And Bungie didn't like that. <laughs> oh, Bungie definitely didn't like that. <laughs> you know, like Bungie was riding high at the time. Like, you you know, Halo Wars, it's easy to forget. Halo Wars, I think, ended up coming out in like 2009 or something like that. Whatever the whatever whatever year it was, um, mm. if not later, but uh, they started development on Halo Wars when like Halo Two was coming out. <laughs> yes, I, that's yeah, yeah. And Bungie was like the golden child, and Halo was their baby, and like now all of a sudden, Ensemble's making a you know an, an RTS spinoff on consoles, which has never worked before. You know what I mean? And, and, like, now they're having to give these dudes access to, like, their story because it was going to be... I think they were planning on coming out around the same time that uh, Halo 3 did, so they needed, like, story details from Halo 3 and shit like that. And, like, it sounded like... It sounded like there was kind of a lot of, like, awkwardness between Ensemble and Bungie. You know what I mean? Well, like, it, it even got to the point where, like, I think Ensemble came out and said, like, you know, Bungie was, like, almost stonewalling them. Yeah. 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 It's just it's just interesting, like like all these things, and like I didn't even realize I had always heard, and and actually I think we've actually uh, I think you can find on YouTube there's actually like alpha like pre alpha gameplay, but uh, of a Halo MMO, and I didn't realize that Ensemble was the one working on that. Um, oh yeah, that's I forgot about that. Yeah, they had a whole they had like three projects in the works. They had Halo Wars, um, something else like a Diablo clone. And they had a Halo MMO that they were making. And they didn't even... This is another interesting thing. Like, Ensemble, I gotta give them credit, man. They're a ballsy studio. Um, they didn't even so ask the, permission. For, yeah, to do the Halo MMO. That I remember reading that. I was like, alright, then. Good yeah, for you I guys. was like, balls on these guys. <laughs> you know? They, uh, they, didn't even, they didn't even ask permission to do it. It's like, fuck. And that ended up getting cancelled, you know? Mm-hmm. So... But but yeah, really really interesting chapter, really fascinating read. It didn't like I said, it ended up being my favorite chapter. Um, the next chapter is Dragon Age Inquisition. How did you feel about this? I'm not too big on the Dragon Age games. Never really got into them myself, but I did, <laughs> I do think it was actually a fascinating read. Um, I definitely liked it. I uh, and it's. I think that game, has, that game itself. I'm just gonna say that, that thing with that game is it has issues. I think that you have with a lot of games. It's just, it's too much. Yeah, like you have to strike a you have to strike a, a proper balance. the The problem with Dragon Age Inquisition was, like, you you think that there needs to be like when when you're developing an RPG, like you want to have a lot of content, um, but as it as it turns out, if you and we'll talk about this a little bit later when they you know when they were developing Witcher 3 they were like okay we have a lot of content but we want to make sure that it all matters and mm-hmm. that if there is a side quest it's not just a bullshit side quest it has to have some kind of twist to it you know yeah my problem with Dragon uh, Dragon Age Inquisition is that it doesn't have that <laughs> like <laughs> for me and you know I love Dragon Age Origins Dragon Age 2 was what it was but then you you know you go and you look at Dragon Age Inquisition and it's huge and it's sprawling and that's great and it's you know it's beautiful and this that and the other, but like there's so much to do and like almost none of it matters. And what's funny is like the the changes that Dragon Age had to make, even just story wise, like the beginning of the game was going to be totally different than it ended up being because like the the original beginning they had of the game sort of killed the stakes of it. Mm. Yeah. And um it's you know the interesting thing about BioWare is like BioWare seems to be really good at like making theme making things seem better on the surface than they actually were because Jason even talks about in here like like I saw a he was talking about that he saw a build and played I think a build of Dragon Age you know at the PAX that it was announced at and uh and like none of that shit made it into the game like <laughs> The entire section was like cut. It's not in the game, you know, uh, which is interesting. So I don't know. I, I don't have a whole hell of a lot to say about Dragon Age Inquisition. It, it's, it was a good read, though. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Uh, the next chapter is Shovel Knight. And this is one where I think you read it and you're like, I want to play Shovel Knight. 
Yeah, it got me in the mood. To, yeah, it definitely got me in the mood to play Shovel Knight, but I'm like, I can't do that. Because there's another game that I need to beat that I'm closer to beating. Yeah, which we'll, we're going to be talking about we'll on into, the main show. Yeah. Yep. So listen to that. But, um, yeah, but Shovel Knight, you know, I fucking, I love Shovel Knight. My only regret is that I did not learn about Shovel Knight until the Kickstarter was already over. Because I mm-hmm. totally would have backed it. This is another Kickstarter back game. Um, just a really fucking, just a really interesting, like, I already knew most of this stuff. Like how it's a, you know, Yacht Club is a collection of, like, X Way Forward devs and stuff like that. Um, and I sort of knew that, like, they severely undercut their budget and like the the fascinating thing about shovel knight and the really cool thing about yacht club in general is like they are not the people that have been there for shovel knight from the beginning are not getting charged a penny for any of the shovel knight content coming out and even when they decided okay we do need to charge for this shit they gave everybody a chance to get the treasure trove before they charged for it you know what i mean yeah in terms of like there, there's a lot of stuff in the industry right now that is like gross practices and like shady shit and Yacht mm-hmm. Club does none of it and I really respect that and even now years after the game has come out I think the game came out like two years ago if not more and like they're still delivering on Kickstarter promises you know mm-hmm. and I respect the shit out of that and while while this the Shovel Knight chapter in Blood, Sweat, and Pixels like it didn't necessarily didn't necessarily tell me a whole lot that I didn't already know about the Shovel Knight development, but like it was still a nice reminder of sort of the business acumen of Yacht Club and how how impressively they've handled themselves being mm-hmm. such a small studio with not as much money as they should have had, you know, to, to make it work. And uh and their unwillingness to compromise on their vision for Shovel Knight. I really respected that. Yeah. These last three chapters are really interesting chapters. Um, chapter eight was Destiny, uh, which is an interesting one. How'd you feel about this one? You know, you know, I enjoyed the hell out of reading that. Yeah, like that was interesting. Yeah, a lot of this stuff has been reported on before, but we were actually we were just playing Destiny two last night, and we were talking about like the way that like Marty was treated. You know, during mm-hmm. Destiny 1's development and stuff like that, and how he ended up getting fired, and, you know, it, some of the practices at Bungie were, like, a little bit shady and stuff like that, and, and just sort of the uh, the way that Destiny changed, like, the uh, the way the story was kind of handled, and one of, actually my favorite part of the Destiny chapter, you know, I mentioned the Diablo 3 thing earlier, which was a cool part, but my favorite part was when Joe Staten just took, like, a... It, it was the chapter when Joe Staten just took a bunch of, like, Destiny 1 story bits that he had been working on and just fucking released it. And, like, he was trying... He wasn't trying to, like... He, he was trying to show how kind of, like, cobbled together the story was at that point and kind of yeah. light a fire under Bungie's ass to fix it, you know? He was like, we yeah. need to sort of, we need to sort of like outwardly acknowledge that this, that this is broken and needs to be fixed. And like, as a result, playing Destiny 1, especially vanilla, you and I were there Ooh. from the very beginning, like, especially playing vanilla D1, the story was a fucking mess. I mean, was, absolute yeah, fucking mess. it was mess. still a fucking mess, dude. And they even say it in the fucking, uh, the book. It's just like that god awful fucking line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. Oh, and I God. like that I like that the book even went as far as to like mention Dinklebot. <laughs> like like what what went on with him. It's just a nice more more so than anything else about this book that I really enjoy is like the the way that it sort of sort of categorizes the development of it even like for little shit like that cuz like it's yeah. so funny People who jumped into Destiny late will never understand what it was like being in vanilla Destiny and how fucking weird it was. That's some real shit. And it, it, I, I've said this before. It's like I actually kind of miss Dinklebot. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a part of me that misses him too. But like, just, it, it's unprecedented, dude. Like, in what other game? Just think about it. From vanilla Destiny, right? E- even putting aside how fucked up and weird the development of vanilla Destiny was, like, in the impossibly high expectations like we're all familiar with the destiny universe now but like when they first revealed destiny like the the expectations for it were so high the book actually mentions like 
like oh like they, they were talking about they wanted this to be the next lord of the rings or a star wars or whatever you know and um it's not quite there <laughs> but yeah it's not quite there but, but we're all very fam- it's it's you know it's wildly successful and we're, we're all very familiar with the destiny universe but like coming in from vanilla destiny like and then seeing where destiny is now a destiny's in a way better i mean it's a wildly different way better game now but like it's so funny to me like like thinking back on how fucking weird it was back then like the vibes of vanilla destiny oh yeah it's like because again like honestly like the most fun you could have in uh destiny one was uh the loot cave and the the the, the least vanilla destiny that's some real shit (laughs) sadly i uh but it's you know and then they completely flipped it around you know like like you said like like we were talking about the diablo 3 guys you know gave them that talk about like okay this is how we changed it and then like luke smith took over and um and really, you know, from Taking King on, Destiny has been fantastic, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, does it have problems? Sure. But even now, Destiny 2 does it have problems? Sure. But it's in such a better such a better place than it was when D1 came out, vanilla. Oh, it definitely is. And the development of it was interesting. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of good to, to read this book and sort of see why things happened the way they did and why that game was so fun. It just, it almost felt like vanilla Destiny... Everything except for just the raw gameplay and, like, the art and the music. Like, the actual story. The only word I can use to describe it is, like, awkward. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good word. For, uh, definitely a good word for it. Like, it, it's so clear that the story was not at the forefront of the minds of the people that were, that were handling Destiny 1's development. And the book drives that home. And that's why, like, Joe Staten was getting the shaft and everything, and he, spoilers, is no longer at Bungie. And uh, they they weren't paying enough, they weren't paying enough mind to the story and the writers, and uh, it ended up really, uh, as a huge detriment to Destiny 1, I think. Oh, um, definitely. Like, like story, story is a fucking big part of a fucking game, man. It's like... Yeah, it totally is. People People don't realize that, like... They don't realize that they don't realize how important a story is until it's bad, and yeah. that's what Destiny One did. <laughs> like Destiny One had a, like they could have done a lot of things with that game. Like again, fuck the Grim War card system. Yeah, that was stupid. Yeah, like, like the game. The, this, the, the issue with Destiny One is the game had potential to have such a fantastic story because the lore is so fucking interesting at Destiny. The lore and in the then, world is great. Yeah. yeah, and they just fucking didn't capitalize on it. So yeah. And even the characters are great, but yeah, like they they totally they totally didn't pay enough mind to the story and and it it ended up showing in the final product. Definitely. Um so good good chapter, good read. Uh the next chapter is The Witcher 3. How'd you feel about this? Made me want to actually play it more. You know, I've actually been wanting to play The Witcher 3 for a while, but I'm like I know better. Yeah, I've so, I've wanted to play that game for years, but I just know I'm never gonna have the time to play it. Never, especially the way the especially reading about how many hours like you shit two th- couple hundred hours just like for one playthrough. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. like they were talking about like uh, in the in the book, like their goal, you know, when they were coming into The Witcher Three, they wanted to make a game that was gonna take at least 100 hours to beat, and then like by the time it shipped, it was like oh, shit, it takes like two or three hundred hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm good, man. I don't got I don't that kind that of moment. time, man. I, but you know, mm-hmm. I gotta respect. You know, I, I really have to respect CD Projekt Red. And again, this is something that I said about um, about Shovel Knight, like their unwillingness to leave their vision behind. You know, and like shit. What I what I found fascinating is that like Poland or or wherever I think it's Poland that they're based in. Um, yeah, it's Poland. They're so proud of like The Witcher and like. Like, it's such a good representation of, like, it's kind of the definitive, like, Polish work of fiction is The Witcher. Yeah. And they're so yeah. proud of it. They, like, gave President Obama, like, a copy of The Witcher 2 when he came to visit Poland, like, years ago. Yeah, I, I, I got a, that got a chuckle out of me. It was, was like, nice. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I love imagining Obama, like, cracking open a, cop, a copy of Witcher 2. <laughs> but, uh no, dude, I, I really got to respect The Witcher 3 after reading this. Like, I, I have to respect the way they handled this. And, you know, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they I don't think they ultimately achieved this goal. But, like, when Bioware was looking at Mass Effect Andromeda, 
they were like, we need to make this game like The Witcher 3. <laughs> They, they did, ooh, no, they definitely didn't do that. <laughs> so they, but it's it's hilarious because coming into The Witcher Three, like the people, you know, Bioware is what they looked at for inspiration. Mm-hmm. So it came full circle when Bioware was looking at them. So, and I, you know, and I love the. Uh, it just has a real bootstraps vibe. You know what I mean? Like it has yeah, a definitely. really good, like like The Witcher Three's development has a really good like. Uh, I don't want to say underdog because you know CD Projekt's a pretty small developer when they started The Witcher Three, and um, you know they made The Witcher One and Two and and people liked it, but The Witcher Three is when it like really blew up, and yep. it's rare that like a third game in the series is the one that blows up. You know what I mean? Like it's rare that that happens, but oh, yeah, uh, that's one of the games I always point to whenever I bitch about Bethesda and how they can't keep getting away with releasing like these buggy, ugly games, I point to The Witcher. I'm like, look at CD Projekt and the way they developed The Witcher and, like, how huge and sprawling and beautiful it is. Like, mm-hmm. the, like other developers have no excuse. Other developers should look at CD, CD Projekt Red and, and be like, okay, like, we need to be better. You know what I mean? Um, the last chapter is a fascinating one because it's about a game that was canceled. Star Wars 1313. How'd you feel about this? This game hurt... This chapter hurt me more with uh, the closing of uh, Visceral recently. Yeah, what what a funny... Um, well, not funny, but what a... What, it's a funny's the wrong <laughs> word. What a... Uh, what an interesting turn of events that we were reading this around the same time that Visceral was closed. Working on basically the studio that like, like the picked up the successor. bones yeah kind of like yeah, yeah the six, like using what was like there and kind of doing their own thing with it but yeah yeah no it was, it was a good chapter though like and you know what's the one of the most interesting things that i took away from this chapter that i didn't realize is that i didn't understand like i i knew a lot of this already but i didn't know that um george lucas was actually working on a uh on a show called like yeah, Star Wars Underworld. Did not know that either. I was like, oh shit, what? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. That was gonna take place on like Coruscant and everything. I was like, okay, that that would have been interesting. Like he was working on that and like this was going to be a tie-in to that originally. And then once mm-hmm. the show got shit canned, they were like, okay, no, this is just gonna be its own thing. And then they made they made the game like they were working on the game and they had a big premiere at E three. I'll never forget that E three like where they premiered dude, that was that. like yeah that that premiere was so fucking awesome dude. And then like I actually didn't realize it was gonna be a Boba Fett game at the at one point. Like, I was like what? Well yeah, yeah like it wasn't until after they already announced it that George Lucas was like oh by the way uh sp- you know change of plans I'm altering the deal pray I don't alter it any further. Uh, this type shit. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this game is gonna be about fucking Boba Fett. You know, have fun. And they're like, but but we already we already created a character and and we already made all this and pe- we've done mocap for cutscenes. He's like, yeah, too fucking bad. <laughs> That's not George. I Lucas. want a Boba. F- I want a Boba Fett game. Fuck you guys. <laughs> yeah, George Lucas just had such a strong like just had such a strong um you know vision for the game and. And I, uh, what I, what I really respect about the ch- this chapter in the book too is that not only does it mourn the cancellation of thirteen thirteen, and first of all, you know, I, I love the, um, I love the camaraderie of the team behind thirteen thirteen, and toward yeah. toward the end of the chapter, like it, they recite like a really heartfelt letter, uh, you know, once once the kind of studio the the head kind of announced that they were closing Lucas Lucas Arts and that thirteen thirteen was being canceled and that Disney was taking over and this that and the other, um, I really loved that. I, like I I loved that the book sort of like revealed how close that team was, and then um, moreover though it it was interesting to me um, how the book like sort of not only mourn the loss of 1313 but also mourn the loss of lucas arts in general yeah because i almost completely forgot like oh shit yeah lucas arts isn't really a thing anymore you know what i yeah, mean it's good. actually you know one of the saddest parts for me is like 
the fact that they were, you know, a lot of them were like, you know, they were hearing like the rumors, the rumblings of like what the, what was going on, and they're like, they can't, they can't shut us down. Like we have like this really anticipated game. It's like one of the most anticipated games of like all time type shit. It's hotly anticipated. <laughs> we had a huge E3 showing, and everybody wants it, and everybody loved what they saw. They're not gonna do shit to us. And nope, mm-hmm. they got the axe. You know, yeah, that shit was. Ugh. So. But, you know, good good chap- good book, man. Like, I, I really liked it. I think, you know, I think we were already kind of talking that we don't know. We've been reading a lot of books about game development lately, and I mm-hmm. love it, and I love books about game development. But I'm almost like, there's a small part of me that's like, I kind of want to move into fiction now <laughs> for the next book. Yeah, yeah kind of take a break, because we do technically have another game design book. <laughs> yeah, there's another read, game design like, book that, yeah. that we were kind of thinking about for November, but we'll, we'll have to talk about it some more. Um. But yeah, that's that's blood, sweat, and pixels. Do you have any closing thoughts before we wrap this up? Nah, I think like I think we covered most of it. Like, it's just honestly like the book is overall like if you don't know anything about like what was going on with these like in the development, like fucking check it out. It's like a really fascinating read. Yeah. Even if you actually do know, honestly, it's still a fascinating read. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I and I, like I said, I think I'm gonna go into into this in more detail whenever. Uh, whenever I uh, record the main episode later. But the um, the audiobook is narrated by Ray Chase, who is, you know, famously uh, Noctis in Final Fantasy XV. So, and he does a good job uh, reading the book. So if you, uh, if you were curious about how the audiobook format of this book is, it's quite good, and I recommend it. <laughs> anyway, that's Blood, Sweat, and Pixels. We will see you in the next book club. Thank you for listening. Thank you for reading with us, if you did. See ya. I'm just kidding. Bye. I'm going to let you say see ya. <laughs> I was like, bitch. I'm like, wait, what? You fucking you confused me. I was like, what? Get fucking dunked on. Bye. Fucking jackass. See ya. <laughs>